Welcome to Pay Attention, interviews about truth in troubling times. I'm Polly Young Eisendrath, and today I'll be talking about racism in Jungian psychology and what to do about it. I'm here with Dr. Christopher Jerome Carter and Dr. John Hayes. And today we will be talking about the book that Dr. Carter has recently edited and published. Both Dr. Carter and Dr. Hayes are Jungian analysts, and they're contributors to this book, which is called Jungian Reflections on Systemic Racism. It's a collection of essays and papers by Jungian analysts and analysts in training that offer individual perspectives and approaches to promoting greater inclusivity in analytic training, theory, and practice. In our conversation today, the three of us, all practicing Jungian analysts, want to clarify what Jung's shockingly racist views mean for us as people and professionals and for the larger Jungian community and beyond. If you doubt the claim that Jung wrote some very racist and white supremacist ideas, here's a passage that was written in 1932. It's quoted by Dr. Carter in the book. The passage quoting Jung, certain people deserve that you shall not be kind. So you need a certain amount of cruelty. Those Negroes are murderous devils who might kill other people as well as yourself. So why should they be free? They had far better be chained. So that's a passage from Jung, published passage. And I hope you can take seriously the idea that Jung was writing from a perspective that very much needs to be corrected, needed to be corrected some time ago. And all of us agree that these kinds of writings should not be erased, but should be commented on and understood and corrected. So in response to these kinds of views and ideas that we find in some of Jung's writings, Dr. Carter writes this, quote, we must verbalize, document, and demonstrate that we embrace much of Jung's analytic theory, but we do not embrace the continued dehumanization of BIPOC people. Individuation is contingent upon neither color, ethnicity, gender, sexuality, nationality, nor socioeconomic factors. In differentiating our perspectives from Jung's, we utilize a wider lens to stimulate insight. So I, I want to thank you, Dr. Carter, for coming on here and also for publishing this book. So let me introduce my guests, uh, Dr. Christopher Jerome Carter, one of the editors of the book, as well as a contributor, is a Jungian analyst and a licensed psychoanalyst who's in private practice in New York City. Dr. Carter attended Princeton Theological Seminary, earning a Master of Divinity degree with a dual concentration in educational psychology and pastoral psychology, followed by a Master of Theology in Bereavement. Then Dr. Carter attended Union Theological Seminary, where he earned a Master of Philosophy in Developmental Psychology, then a doctorate in Psychiatry and Religion with a concentration in depth, depth psychoanalytic theory. Dr. John Michael Hayes, a contributor to this book, is a psychologist, a psychoanalyst, and an Episcopal priest in the Baltimore and Washington area. He did his graduate studies in counseling and psychology at Catholic University of America and has been a licensed psychologist since 1978. In addition to being a Jungian analyst, Dr. Hayes is a graduate of the psychoanalytic training program at the Washington Psychoanalytic Institute. So welcome to both of you, extremely well-educated people. It's a pleasure to be with you. Um, so before I begin, I want to also make clear the way I'm entering this conversation because many of you who listen to my work and know what I do don't really know much about my background. So I want to share a passage from a foreword that I wrote to a book by an African-American Jungian analyst, Dr. Fanny Brewster. Dr. Brewster's book is called African-Americans and Jungian Psychology, Leaving the Shadows. It was published by Routledge in 2017. So I want listeners to know that I also have a history in the conversation we're about to have. 
Over the years, I've entered into it in different ways. And here, I'm going to read part of this forward that sort of summarizes a little bit of my background in this conversation. When I entered Jungian training in, in 1979 and witnessed the absence of African Americans in almost every setting, that would be from public settings to professional settings, in which Jung's ideas were taught or discussed, I was uneasy and I wondered what was wrong. Previously, in every aspect of my life since I could recall, there were black and brown people, including my Creole aunt who lived next door, she called herself Creole, during my entire growing up, and my mixed race cousins who lived with her, my, my black friends in whose houses I visited through all my school years, followed by my time at a t State University and Bennett College in Greensboro, North Carolina, including a stint in the Black Power Movement. I'm from a mixed race family myself, and I had never been in any community in which Black people were absent. I recall wondering what kind of world I had fallen into when I got into the Jungian world, and I wondered if I wanted to stay. Then I began to train to be a Jungian analyst after I wondered whether I wanted to stay. So by 1979, when I entered the training, I had read and studied volume 10 of Jung's collected work. I was distressed then, very distressed about Jung's unexamined assumptions of racial hierarchy and his stereotyping of minorities. I was more distressed hearing my Jungian colleagues speak about the shadow being black and interpreting black people in anyone's dreams as shadow figures and assuming that the collective unconscious had a racial hierarchy built into it, which was not at all uncommon when I was in those early training days in the 1980s. When I tried to speak about these concerns to my peers and my elders, my critiques fell on deaf ears. The response was consistently, Jung's ideas were typical of his time and place. And I thought, okay, true enough, but should we go on repeating his mistakes? In 1987, I presented and then published a paper entitled The Absence of Black Americans as Jungian Analysts because I wanted to start a conversation about racism as a psychological complex. Over the years, I gave up that idea until Dr. Brewster wrote and published her book. But even then, it has taken more time for this conversation to get going. Your book, Christopher, remains in many ways the first remarkably comprehensive one that covers the full topics, all the topics of racism as a psychological complex, white supremacy in Jungian psychology, archetypes of color, colorism, Jung's assumptions about the collective unconscious and his desires to use the symbolism of Black peoples in the U.S. and Africa to support his theories. So I think you've opened the possibility for a frank and I think friendly conversation, even though these difficult topics often make people anxious. And so I would like to be sure that we all speak openly and can be at ease about being able to share our own experiences personally and professionally. So with this long beginning, I first want to ask my two guests to tell me what their definitions are for race and racism, because many times people don't begin with a definition. So Chris, first, uh, thank you for being here and tell us what you mean by race and what you mean by racism. Now, isn't that something though, that we have to define this term and to be born into a situation where I'm identified as having a race, but I can't find a definition of what it is that I am. I rejected the idea of race since I was a little child because my mother, then a young woman said, we're all equal. There's only one humanity. Uh, don't, don't let them tell you that you're a race. But we did, acknowledge racists. Okay, so what is race? Well, according to the American Heritage Dictionary, race is a group of people identified uh, as distinct from others based on group attributes, uh, but is generally 
acknowledge that race is not biologically valid. It's not a valid classification in part because there's no more generic variation within groups than there is between them. Uh, so, you know, I, researching Jung and race, I, I saw this, uh, what volume is it? I want to say it's volume 10, but I'm not sure. But there is conversation between UNESCO, the UN, and Jung trying to address the race problem. And the UN says race, which directly affects millions of human lives and causes countless conflicts, is rooted, quote unquote, in the mind. World War II was made possible by the doctrine of the inequality of men and races. So what's race? Race is a false construct that has economic benefits uh, as People reached out into the world and wanted to amass more goods. They needed to justify how they could put other people, other beings that look like humans under such brutal animal-like treatment. And it continues because there are benefits uh, for those who are seemingly at the top of the race pyramid, but race does not exist. Racism does exist, and that's the attitude that another is not equal to you. Whether you see them as above you or below you, at the core, as John writes about really well, it's the race archetype, it's, it's the whiteness archetype. It's over-identifying with the archetype of white. It has images of purity, images of saintliness, images of cleanliness, that in general, so many different cultures agree on. Mm -hmm. But making it literal by your skin tone and saying, I'm that, that's racism. That's great. I think it's a very comprehensive, comprehensive beginning conversation about race and racism. And I want to switch over to John then and, and uh, ask you how you look at what race means and what you mean by it, and then what racism is. You know, a, a way of starting to respond, Polly, would be to uh, John Updike uh, has uh, three daughters, uh, and all three daughters married African-American guys. And uh, he says, you know, there's one race, there's the human race. And, uh, and I think I agree very much with Chris, everything he said. Of course, it, it's a social construction. Um, and uh, it has no basis in biology, except for superficial characteristics. That, um, and, uh, and, and it uh, serves a social purpose. I mean, uh, they're human beings like hierarchy, and we want to be at the top of the hierarchy and put other people at the bottom of the hierarchy. Uh, hopefully, uh, as we get more conscious, that, that, uh, that drive for superiority of supposed positions of superiority uh, at the expense of other human beings will somehow uh, become less of a dominant feature of our species. But, you know, what is race? It's it, it's a, a social construction that serves uh, unsavory kinds of needs for the most part. And racism? And racism is the, uh, uh, you know, in, in my chapter, I'd like to think of it as, uh, as a, um, uh, a complex, you know, in the sense that you only, Meta complex is a, a sort of state of mind that includes some features and excludes other realities, and uh, and when it's held rigidly, uh, really is a kind of a mini psychosis of a kind, where it's not really a perception of reality; it's an exclusion of reality. Um, and unfortunately, we know this in our country. Um, uh, this is all too common and uh, has has reached dangerous proportions. Uh, as, as we know. There is some kind of belief in individuation and consciousness in the Jungian world that people can, through their own awareness, become conscious of their own motivations, their intentions, their desires that might even be hidden from them initially. And in this idea of psychological complex, is usually a subject and an object. There is usually some identification of oneself and a projection of something into another. And when it comes to racism, 
It's often based on uh, aspects of oneself that one is not comfortable with, familiar with, or even that one may idealize that get projected onto somebody else because they're not known to the self. And uh, in some ways, you could say the concept of race was in was a great opportunity for slave owners to create divisions between so-called white people and so-called black people. And so uh, this idea of race was used especially in slavery. Uh, lots of people are familiar with that now to make divisions between um, people who were allying with each other, who were oppressed, who were in slavery and servant roles, but allowing white people then to gain their freedom, so-called white people, whereas so-called black people could not attain their own freedom. Um, and I think it's very important to recognize that there's no biology in race at all. So it is a social construct, but it's also, let's say, uh, an individual convenient perspective for organizing something that you're uncomfortable with. And it almost always carries this uh, this kind of dehumanizing uh, label. And like mm. it's the, that people are called animals or they're treated like objects or they're called demons. They're no longer human. They're no longer like me. They're like something else. Yeah. And that is to me a really key factor in racism. And of course, you know, we're seeing something now in Israel, and since October 7th, we're seeing this organization again of, of this kind of projection and splitting, and and it's it's based on, I would say, to some extent, racism again. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I think that in order for humans to really deconstruct their racism, they have to look at the issues of projection or the ways that we perceive each other, you know, that I look at you, you look at me, you think, oh, I'm a certain kind of person, or you look at the way I dress or the kind of name I have, and you make assumptions about my motivations, my intentions. And if we could be modest about those, just to know that we might be wrong, that's a start right there. And uh, like you, Christopher, I grew up in a family that was of mixed race, but people didn't really talk about race. And so even though my father said we were Cherokee or my aunt said she was Creole, I don't know, there wasn't much fuss made about that. And it, it really, I didn't really didn't get a lot of sense of fussing about these things until I got out of Akron, so to speak. It wasn't as though, you know, I didn't know that there were other situations other than the ones I lived in, but I didn't know them well. And and finally, when I got out, I started seeing that people were projecting things into people of different colors, and um, and it was confusing to me. But uh, I'd like to then move on to the next conversation here. Well, Polly, it's, can I ask you a question? Sure, of course. What is race and what is racism? For me, race is a construct, and it's a construct about difference, and it's a construct that I think was energized or, let's say, um, uh, how do I want to say it, given fuel uh, resources through slavery in America, that this country was founded really a lot of the wealth on slavery and the, um, on the oppressions of people of color, but uh, in part that that history, that early history I've just recently read a book called Benjamin Banneker and Us, which is about 11 generations of an American family. And it's about a free black man and um, a, an Irish indentured servant who married and started the first generation of an American family. And that family has produced altogether 24,000 people. And I wouldn't be surprised if my family were in it. I mean, I just don't have, I have, I don't have a, an unbroken history, so I don't know. But uh, so, you know, one thing that I learned about that particular history of an American family is that the, um, all of the issues between blacks and whites, they weren't clear until various laws were made. There were laws in, that were articulated by white men, and those laws were articulated 
really for the body of the white woman, that only white men could possess that body. White men could possess the body of black women. And um, lots of things got sort of, um, let me say, uh, established at the time of slavery and at the time of American slavery where children were going to be sold from their parents. I mean, the splitting up of families in American slavery kind of makes it distinctive from slavery in other countries. There's been slavery throughout the world, but the way slavery developed here was a lot around splitting whites and blacks. So for me, race is an invention. I don't think it has any application biologically, nor do I think it has application um, in reality. It's an application that's entirely social, economic, uh, interpersonal application. So racism, of course, is the application of these differences in a way that gives advantage um, and also in a way that creates dehumanization uh, in regard to various contexts in which people live. Uh, I don't think that racism is in any way a necessary construct, even though people do like hierarchy. I really agree with you, John, that people like hierarchy. Humans do. They seem to feel comfortable in it. It's very difficult to get to equality. Mm -hmm. But um, I, I think that uh, racism is not a necessary. It's, it's, based on, uh, it's based on seeing primarily like the way somebody looks and then making up a whole thing internally. So that's my, that's my thought about it. Um, and uh, I, so I tend to feel that uh, as a Jungian analyst, I need to somehow be apologetic, um, but I don't like feeling that way. So I don't, I, I feel I, I need to say, you know, I'm using this theory, which has a lot of racism buried in it. And I, I would like to expose that in a way so that we stop doing that. And I, I, I felt early on when I was in training that uh, this idea of the shadow was one of the main things that continued to be used in a racist way. And almost like people couldn't hear their racism when they would use the concept. So um, does that make sense to you, Christopher? It does. I, I When I think of racism, I can't divorce it from behavior, right? Uh -huh. Because cause someone's yeah. expressing something when we, in a way we see, we hear, we feel racism because it's expressed. That's right. If a person kept it to themselves, you, you might get it through their facial gestures. You might get it through a sneering. You can feel it. Right. Uh, but it's it's really connected to behavior and action. Yes, yes. It ex it's expressed. It's expressed. And I think it's emotional in its expression. Often it's a psychological complex. It's a complex that activates people and then it leads to actions. But like you're saying, sometimes it's implied. Sometimes it's active. Sometimes it's passive. But yes, it's it's also expressed. And I, I was saying more in perception. Yes. Uh, and, and I think also we want to remember what it took to get those black bodies to America. The level of inhumanity to be cramped where you can't lift your head up, you can't, where you're trying to kill your neighbor, possibly just so you have a little space, a little breathing room. The desperation for everyone on the ship slave owner or trader and the product black body everyone's suffering yeah. uh, but the idea that bodies could be such commo a commodity a thing you might lose some you might lose some keep going this one's going to sell right this one's going to make some money this one's profitable he's a good worker does all that go away I have experienced bosses, bosses, right, in employment who carry on the same mentality when they see a person who is of darker skin. But the person of white skin, you know, they're, they're workers, they're educated, uh, they're professionals. Uh, so it, it's interesting that the, the lack of humanity 
and I, I think there's something with the shadow there because shadow is so not what we want to be. It's so egotistonic. It's so disgusting. Uh, and uh, these projections, they happen as, as smoothly as breathing out. Mm -hmm. They just happen. They don't really take thought. Adler might say, okay, they do take thought. You're, you're, you're escaping by the idea that you think your emotions overcome you. But I think Jung has something here with the way the unconscious can do things to us. We do what we would not do. So mm -hmm. beautiful people who might say, oh, this character on TV is cool. I like Denzel Washington. Beyonce is the bomb, whatever. But when you meet a person face to face, when you see a real person, then there's a there's a, a interesting kind of emotional constipation, and that that's the dragon's tail to to the shadow stuff, right? Um, yeah, I, I think I, I want to kind of bring John in here on the sort of the, since he did his chapter on the white complex, yes. and uh, <laughs> we're talking about the shadow and the the black side of it, but I I also I understand what you're saying um, very much in terms of the way people respond and react to color of skin, maybe other kinds of signals. I would say that that color thing, and I would like to hear John talk about it, does occur across across cultures. It's it's not just an American thing, and I've seen it in Japan and in India, um, and it it there seems to be uh, you know some archetypal meaning there that goes across cultures, but there was a way that slavery was organized in the US that was really different from slavery in other cultures. And I do think that led to certain kinds of, let's say underlying uh, aspects to uh, the racist complexes in America versus uh, in India, Japan, uh, China, where there are racist complexes all many, many cultures, you know. But so John, I'd like you to talk about the white complex and um, about white supremacy, the way you organize sure. your chapter. So, you know, one of the things I'm, we're talking here, I think very astutely about individual dynamics. You know, how does a white person meet a black person? History is always in the room, no question about that. And projection is certainly certainly a, a viable way of thinking about uh, how we make assumptions about the other and, 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 and put onto them uh, our negative qualities. It's interesting, you know, we think about the shadow um, and we think sometimes like in training institutes back in your day, uh, Polly, they would say, well, the black person shows up in the dream. That is the shadow, right? Well, I was thinking about that because very often, I think, when people have a dream of a black person, uh, uh, it's sort of an unexamined uh, prejudice right there in the dream, which they would never acknowledge. But, you know, what are the qualities of that black person? Uh, if they're very negative things, well, that's confirming there's... Uh, on the surface, a very uh, polite, you know, enlightened sort of social stance, but underneath, maybe something hasn't changed. But, but more than that, I'd like to think about, you know, I, I, in my paper, I brought in the uh, thinking of Rene Girard, uh, yeah. who, you know, has this, I, I think, very compelling theory, anthropological theory, that, you know, as, as human groups evolve, they they have what he calls uh, mimetic uh, uh, violence that, that that always threatens to break out. We want what the other one has, um, mm -hmm. and and what what he says is that as human groups develop, uh, one of the ways they've got to uh, relieve the uh, the tension in the group and to relieve the uh, threat of violence, uh, just sort of and mayhem just taking over, is to find a scapegoat and mm -hmm. to direct the group's violence towards that scapegoat and. You know, think about lynching in the South. And we're not talking about ancient history now. We're talking about the 40s, uh, mm -hmm. maybe even the 50s. I'm not sure of the exact history. But mm -hmm. uh, a, a tremendous amount of people, this is not a rare event. This is sort of a, a rather uh, frequent event uh, in the American South and even pretty uh, close to the North and in our state of uh, Maryland. Here. Um, the groups would find uh, uh, an infectious camaraderie and uh, uh, attacking and, and mutilating a black person and lynching them up. Uh, and that camaraderie, the memory of that is sort of, once they get memorialized, uh, it's a very, very uh, terrible uh, feature of human nature 
that this is how um, how we sometimes find ourselves spotting. And here it is again with the, the Trump rallies. It's a very same dynamic, a camaraderie. Some people say they, they'd hate to see Trump go away because it's so much fun to go to the rallies. And the fun is the camaraderie and, and focusing on a scapegoat who you want to destroy uh, as a way of bringing everybody together and, 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 and celebrating this violent uh, violence. So I, I just want to respond in this one way, John, to say that I think that the way that we uh, scapegoat and the way that we uh, dream about uh, the other depends on who we're familiar with as well. Yes. Because I, uh, when I was in my Jungian training, I always had Black people in my dreams. They were my friends. And suddenly this idea that they were labeled in a certain way yeah, automatically. was a surprise to me. I hadn't ever imagined that groups of people would be labeled by a psychological label that meant in some way that person symbolized, that kind of person symbolized a psychological function for someone else. I mean, even the anima animas, I saw more as an abstraction, like that you could have a projection of your animas into a horse or something. I mean, it didn't have to be a man. It could be something, but it was something masculine if you were female. So I, I was a little shocked that it was so narrow in this Jungian idea that uh, the shadow, which I understood meant what was in your sort of um, blind spot, you know, it was something you couldn't see in yourself. And so you projected it forward onto others. I, I understood it as a blind spot kind of thing, but I, I did not know it was going to be literally Black people in your dream. So that was a little bit shocking to me at the time. And then it was even more shocking when I tried to have conversations. And I said, that's just not true for me. I and I can't be the only person it's not true for because, you know, I I'm I I grew up around a, a lot of people who had lots of friends of particularly African Americans. I mean, in my community, there weren't many Chinese people, there were no Jewish people, there were people that were definitely unfamiliar to me. And as I got to know them, I projected into them until I got to know them. But uh, there's something about projection and scapegoating that also requires being unfamiliar and dehumanizing yeah. the other person. And of course, scapegoating can occur in families, et cetera. But it is still, I think, based on a not knowing dehumanizing thing that the other person is being used for. And uh, so, you know, I I wonder about that in Jungian theory, like, you know, how that went on for so long that Black people could be used to symbolize somebody else's blind spot. And then that could be considered theory instead of prejudice or stereotype. But I, I don't know if that is connected simply to the underlying kind of feeling of white superiority that was maybe connected to Jung as a, a figure that he was idealized by so many people? I don't know. I mean, I'm honestly asking this, whether you have a an idea about that, because I felt it was very, very peculiar at, at, you know, at that particular point in the 1980s that I could be around intelligent people and they could be talking like this without apparently, you know, of con uh, being concerned about it, and part or of either of you. There were no black people in the room. There, there were, were no, no black, black people, people in the room that they knew that they had a personal relationship with, that they developed empathy for, and that's what breaks right. the spell, I think. Right. That's, that's right. That's yeah. right. That's right. And um, but still, it had you know things had kind of been going on for a while. I mean, Jung died in 1961. He arguably lived into the 20. 20th century pretty far there there was even the, the beginning you know as christopher said there was the beginning of knowledge about uh you know the who african americans really were frederick Douglass had written i mean jung could have i i don't think he would have been you know necessarily reading in that area but 
they he could have and since he was writing about negroes it seems like you know he might have thought to do some research but uh i i don't know if it is just the complex of white superiority that allows that to go on or or how you think of white superiority or how you think of it in relation to uh carl jung for example uh you know who uh you know grew up more or less poor as a son of a pastor but in a very you know homogenous white uh european culture uh any thoughts about how that could have lasted for so long or or how you know the idea of um of the black person could play such a big role in jungian psychology uh, in a way that was sort of symbolic, sort of literal, when it wasn't happening in other, uh, you know, there, nobody was symbolizing like that. Any any thoughts about that? It is he didn't have any relationship with black people. I mean, he talks about a barber in, in Louisville, and that that seems to be extent of his interpersonal. Of course, there was his, his time in Africa itself, but that's a, a, a rather different kind of experience, which seems to have had a profoundly shaking. Uh, ground shaking effect on. What do you think about his time in Africa? Or tell me what your thoughts are, either of you, about it was a relatively short time. He made a lot of assumptions based on his short time there. But on the other hand, no one had done what he tried to do, which was to go out and actually meet people who uh I mean, there are plenty of people writing about primitives, you know, who hadn't met anybody from any mm -hmm. background different than their own. But right. um what what do you think about the experiences he had there, as well as what he did with those ideas that he uh, that he let's say gleaned, you know, from being in Africa. Do, does either one of you have a a sense of how that fits into the puzzle? Well, first of all, you know, I, I write in the chapter I contribute. There was a Solomon Carter Fuller. Dr. Sol Solomon Carter. Oh, Fuller, yes, right, right. Good right. friends with Stanley Hall, right? right. Uh, correspondence with Sigmund Freud. And when uh, they met at Clark University, there's a, a nice photo with Solomon Carter Fuller standing inches away from C.G. Jung. Here is a African-American doctor, one of the pioneers in the studies of Alzheimer's, having correspondence with Freud, right there with, with Stanley Hall. I can't say that Jung was blind to this guy mm -hmm. or blind to his brilliance. Mm -hmm. um, it's, I think it's a matter of choice. And we really, I think we, I think we tend to want, not saying you, but we tend to want to, Jungians tend to want to make a path for Jung not to have been, to have been ignorant to have been sleeping at the will, to have not been exposed enough. But he was researching different cultures, different places. Uh, he had enough resource to see the humanity in others, but there's no way you can check on equality, right? Mm -hmm. We're born, we die. Yeah, there's a lot of theory I could go into and why he would be like that. But I, I do think that to some degree it was a choice. So would you say right. that, he, do you think that, um, so again, you know, Stanley Hall is kind of an interesting character because he was a firm believer in eugenics, but he also thought interracial marriage was fine. And so it's, he was sorting things out in an interesting way himself. And um, I, uh, Dr. Fuller was his dentist or his doctor i can't remember no he's just not he he was a relationship to he to was, hall yeah. i think he was his doctor his doctor so um you know it, it could be that jung saw this man as an exception and he just didn't pay attention or it could be that jung was so frankly racist that he just didn't think about it at all you know he just sort of said I don't know what he said to himself, but uh, I I do wonder myself about whether Jung was influenced by the eugenics movement that at the beginning of uh, American psychology and Stanley Hall was the president of the first 
uh, American Psychological Association. And there was a lot of theorizing about eugenics. And the eugenics uh, that was being theorized was that there was a hierarchy of races and that if people, and that, that at, the, at these different levels, there, was, there were different kinds of IQ, there were different kinds of abilities built in to the races. And that if people were assigned to their right place in society, they would be more comfortable functioning in that right place so that it would be kind of a useful benign feature of American psychology for us to use various tools to get people assigned to their right place. So Jung was meeting that, maybe, you know, for the first time he's meeting a society that does have different uh, colors of people, different backgrounds of people and so on. And so he's hearing this kind of scientific theory that there are layers or levels in different kinds of people. And he's applying his ideas to um, what he's hearing about American psychology. I'm speculating. I don't know that that's true, but I wonder if, if some of that went on. And for that reason, you might've been speaking to uh, Stanley Hall about eugenics, but not noticing who his doctor was, you know? Yeah. Well, you know, America was really uh, wrestling with the race problem. The race problem. The race uh, problem. So if, if eugenics is something that, that Jung could have employed, and it's interesting because we don't see it in his work, not quite the same creature. Uh, I think he could have done it pretty smoothly. He the layers to... of the unconscious, though, isn't it? Sort of the, the layers of the unconscious is kind of a eugenics. Um, I felt that it was sort of a eugenic structure that there are different races that that reach different levels. Of... Yeah, I, yeah, I don't, I, I don't think that's a correct reading of of Jung when it comes to the, if you want to say, layers of the of psyche. Um, you know, we all have these depths. Ian Lenoff, yeah. uh, Dr. Lenoff makes a, a pretty interesting argument in the second chapter of the book. And I'm, I'm gonna paraphrase, and I hope I do her justice with saying this, um, but if I understand her argument correctly, uh, she's saying that Jung was on a journey, unconscious to himself, the journey of individuation, of kind of refamiliarizing himself with the primitive, to identify the primitive in himself, that we need to get to the basic primary levels of psyche for individuation to really do something. And that he was on a journey towards his own blackness in this way. But he didn't yes. get there. <laughs> That's her argument. Said, she says that, and I read her argument and it's, it's well written. I, I feel again, that's a little literal about what individuation is. You know, I think there are dynamics in our personalities that get organized in ways that are out of our awareness. And that at the most so-called primitive levels, those are our so-called most violent dynamics and that they can't be really symbolized by other people. You know, they're, they're somehow relevant to our own emotional organization and that they wouldn't be symbolized by people in other societies or cultures. I, I see her point symbolically, but I don't know if I would agree with it. Um, I'm interested in bringing John back in around because I know John, I, you, I read, you know, you certainly have a, 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 a different kind of background than I have. And you grew up with uh, really, I think, uh, having um, a, a, a kind of a collision in trying to work with uh, your own experiences of African-American people uh, in relation to uh, your family and the norms in your family. So I, I wonder if you would just, I'd sure. like you to, to talk a little bit about the way you look at whiteness and the um, complex of whiteness, as well as uh, however you want to bring in then the way you think Jung, uh, let's say, mm, maybe unconsciously uh, introduces white supremacy. I'm not sure if it's fair to say that, but uh, however you want to say it. What to say about Jung? I mean, I think there's many Jungs, and 
uh, like most people, uh, there isn't a great consistency uh, in his attitudes. It, he has his bad moments. He has better moments. I mean, it needs to be said, he said terrible things, accurately terrible things about uh, Western Europeans uh, also um, being, you know, uh, really kind of a, a blighted race headed for destruction. And right. history has sort of uh, confirmed some of that. So um, I, I don't think there's any doubt that uh, Jung had unexamined uh, uh, attitudes about uh, other peoples who we hardly knew and had very little relationship with. And, uh, you know, being in middle Europe uh, and uh, a, a man of his um, uh, stature, a man of his class, and uh, uh, his uh, little mini castle on Lake Zurich, um, I think it would be very easy to have a sense of superiority about his place in the world and uh, and the perceived status of other people so that he really didn't know very well. Um, you know, when, when Jung goes to India, you know, he hardly gets off the boat. Right. Uh, I mean... Um, assuming he has nothing to learn there and um, probably at another level being very frightened of the otherness and the numinosity of the otherness uh, and all that that carried for him. Probably in Africa also, I think, probably. Um, now, my own experience, Polly, is not that different from yours in some ways because my first eight years of my childhood were spent in Brooklyn in a very uh, integrated neighborhood. I mean, everybody was in everybody's house and I, I'm very grateful my parents were, uh, for, for people of uh, Irish Catholic background in the 50s, had fairly advanced and enlightened attitudes and benign attitudes. I mean, everybody was welcome in our house. There was no distinction made about any of that. And none of that kind of uh, uh, talk that would be uh, go on in the places was allowed for us. Uh, and we, we all grew up with the, those kinds of attitudes. And then we moved to a place called Rosedale, which is mm -hmm. uh, okay. you know, just on the border of uh, Nassau County, as far out. My father had to live in the, the city limits, and that's as far as you could go. Um, and there was no black people there at all. It, it was like there were three kinds of people. You were either Jewish or Italian or Irish. And there was a few older wasp people that were there before the, the migration for Brooklyn, but it was all, all white people. And, um, and that was the next eight years of my, my childhood. Um, very interestingly, uh, Rosedale now is 90% black. Um, um, and, and I think I mentioned in the book how in the uh, uh, early 70s, uh, Bill Morris went and did a special on Rosedale because the few intrepid black people that were starting to move uh, out of the city, they wanted to live in, uh, in Rosedale. Uh, it, was, it could have been Alabama. I mean, the houses were firebombed and the same kind of scapegoating violence just sort of uh, erupted. Uh, horrifying, you, you know. So I, I guess what I would like to to hear from you is sort of how you brought your background into, uh, you know, understanding Jung, and especially understanding these issues that might interface with racism, like the way that the shadow was understood and articulated, as well as, you know, the idea that that European culture was somehow at the top of the cultural hierarchy and that um, African culture was at the bottom. And also the other thing being that, um, that you can make use of other people's uh, let's say, ways of life to symbolize something about yourself. I mean, um, I, I, don't, I wonder what you did with that material in yourself or, you know, I think you came late to understanding and studying Jung's ideas because I saw that you first became a, a psychoanalyst through the, uh, through the Washington uh, Psychiatric, or you, it wasn't the Washington School of Psychiatry, you finished at the Psychoanalytic Institute. You know, I, I, I went to the old institute back in the 90s for two oh. years. So I had a, a real immersion. I had a long analysis with Jerome Bernstein, went there for two oh, years. Oh, okay. And okay. Uh, for a myriad of reasons, I was getting divorced. A lot of, it was just okay. not a time to be in training. Um, but I continued, you know, Mara Sadoli, did we, Mara Sadoli? Mm -hmm. Mara Sadoli? No. 
She's a, a Michael Fordham uh, person. She was in Washington. I continued a, a Jungian analyst. And I continued with her for about four years. So I had a lot of Jungian stuff. Uh, and going that idea of going up to New York every week uh, just got get, gets old real fast. Um, so um, that's why I did did trading at the Washington because I really didn't want to. But I was never a card carrying Freudian. I mean that I was always sort of a Jungian at heart. But okay. So. Then I came back to JPA and finished up the training. They gave me credit for what I did before, so it didn't take so long. And uh, a lot of it was during uh, COVID times. So, so how did you try to make sense of all this yourself? I mean, as you went through the training and as you thought about what was around you, did you wrestle with it or did you just well, sort of endure it? You know, when I came to JPA, and it's a scam three and a half years ago, it's not a long time ago, um, and of course it was on Zoom. So here you have like, you know, uh, 40 faces or something. I was really gratified to see there were four or five black people there. Um, and that would not have been the case in the nineties. So I felt my, my friend, Chris Carter here, uh, and uh, a few other people, I was glad at least, you know, certainly not, uh, you know, a, uh, a majority by any means, but it was a certainly at least more than expected representation. I was very glad for that. Um, now, Chris, you, you'd have to talk about what you experienced at the Institute, because, I mean, I'm a white guy. I, there are things that would just I wouldn't pick up uh, that might be in the air. And I just, you know, I think reasonably sensitive person. But, uh, you know, but you, you, you'd be more in tune than I would. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because I want to be fair to the Institute. Uh, I will certainly speak my truth. I, I think I'd rather talk in generalities because these things are happening at training institutes oh, of yeah. various paradigms all yeah. over the country yeah and by by nature of the fact that we uh came from the jpa you know it looks like possibly we're just citing the jpa but we're not doing that we're talking about systemic racism right and, and it's, in, it's in every institution in the country yes and Thankfully, so, every institution of any caliber are sort of examining themselves and trying to get more uh, conscious of these. Because, you know, I have dual citizenship in the sense that I'm also at the Washington Baltimore uh, Psychoanalytic Association. I teach there. And the very same things are going on, you know, um, uh, trying to counter the mistakes of the past, uh, trying to learn from them. And, um, and, and the, the American Psychoanalytic Association is, is roiling with, with issues around these these kinds of topics and concerns. So yeah. it's, it's all over. And certainly, you know, the universities are too. Yeah. So I want to just say that the JPA means Jungian Psychoanalytic Association yeah. because people listening to this may not have ever heard of it. And so the Jungian Psychoanalytic Association is in New York City. And uh, I think both of you are wanting to say that you know, it's not exceptional in terms of the ways that things came out and were struggled with and so on, uh, and that there are many of these struggles going across all the psychoanalytic training institutes, but those institutes aren't dealing with primarily Carl Jung's theories. I yes. mean, so we're trying to talk about particularly Carl Jung's theories and how we take responsibility for advancing those theories in this period of time when people are becoming, let's say, more conscious and I think more expressive about racist issues that may have been hidden or not talked about previously. So, um, yeah. and so, yeah. You know, I, I think it's, I think they weren't hidden and I don't think they were untalked about. I think it's just that uh, maybe we are getting those of people of color are gaining more power where we can actually yeah. more access to expressing our voices. Um, yeah. But we've been expressing these complaints that to so many people look novel uh, for many years from year one, right? Um, so what was year one for you? What was year one when you first got started getting interested in Jung? And uh, where were you? Were you at Princeton Theological Seminary or at some, yeah, tell me about that and what I it's was, been like. I was at Denison University. I was, oh, uh, yeah. 
a double major in music and world religions. It was almost a triple major in Spanish. I was a minor in Spanish. And I was thinking about uh, switching one of my majors, probably religion, not, not music, to psychology. And uh, I went to the library and I was looking at books and I didn't see a lot of Freud, but they had Adler. Uh, and one of my teachers, uh, Walter Eisenweiss, who uh, left the Nazi army, escaped to New York, or sorry, New York, escaped to America, um, at like political asylum, uh, oh. was one of my teachers. He was a student of Rudolf Bultmann. Oh. And oh. he also taught philosophy. And he, had, for, for a group, a small group of esteemed students, now these guys, they worked hard, they deserved to be in that little group. But he would give them Jung. Oh. He would introduce them to Jung. And it was, he would, there was something about this writing he said was very difficult to grasp. Pay attention if you start feeling an effect on you. And I wanted to know more, but I wasn't part of that group. I had, there were senior students, and I think I was like a sophomore at that time. Um, but uh, at Princeton Seminary, I might have read one or two things about Jung. And what was good was that he was able to link uh, this religious spiritual dynamic to something I considered to be science. And I wanted to bridge both worlds because I thought I was going to be a pulpit minister, but I also wanted to do counseling somehow. And I wanted to be an analyst since I was 12 years old. Uh, didn't know what kind, but I wanted to be able to sit and talk to people and listen. Uh, Union Seminary was my real first full-on exposure under Dr. Ann Ulnoff and Dr. Harry Fulgerty. Um, it's interesting. I just learned today Stanley Hall was a graduate of Union Seminary. Oh, oh I um, it. yeah, yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it was it was full immersion with Anne. I mean, we we were very eclectic. She she taught each theory, each paradigm on its own. You know, mix them up together, respect the paradigms. Uh, but Jung had a special. He has a special in where we got to acknowledge a spiritual level. Yes. And, you know, I'm glad he had the courage to acknowledge that, lack of better words, level, wavelength, dimension, uh, that's, that was the hook. And then I said, okay, I've got to study Carl Jung. Now, I fell in love with object relations. I thought I was going to be a, a full-on neo-Freudian. Uh, I love Freud. Um, I, I love Winnicott. I'm, I'm a great fan of Otto Kernberg. But you know, I can't get away. So it went from Adler to Freud to Jung. Yeah. And you, um, you know, as you're talking about your history, I'm remembering some of mine too, but did you uh, come across uh, volume 10 at that point or was that uh, later? I didn't come across volume 10 until about 2019. Oh. Right. Uh, after about three years of complaining to teachers about the, this racist stuff, what, what do we do with this stuff? How how how, mu how much is, uh, of this stuff is integral to the theory? Mm -hmm. And am I going to do another two years here? Right, um, getting the same kind of feedback, which felt, just felt really protective of you. Uh, I complain, complain, and eventually we we had a, a kind of a panel to address the issue. That panel was the start of a great growth that's still happening at the JPA. Um, we're having the discussions that are very difficult to have, but um, I was asked to present on the panel, and uh, that's when I started doing the research, and it led to the JAP, the Journal of Analytical Psychology paper that was published in 2021. Um, but once I start working on that paper, because I want to express, here's a very influential guy. He's still majorly influential and deservingly so. Mm -hmm. More people could benefit from learning about analytical psychology. But analytical psychology needs to grow. Jung would say, don't worship me. And also, this is not a final product. Just like individuation oh. is an ongoing process, you don't get to say, yay, tell us, I'm there. Uh, the field has to keep growing. Uh, so what do we do about this 
racism, this blatant con. I, uh, that's when I did re research. I looked for every time you use the N-word. I looked up whenever you use the concept of race. And I, I found myself in Chet and Volume 10. And yeah. that's the gold mine. It's, it's, <laughs> there's some ouchers there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's where, I mean, when I think when I did my paper on the absence of African-Americans, um, I researched Volume 10 because I was looking up various terms and I was shocked. I was really, um, it, there was a kind of brutality in the language that I hadn't expected. And, um, and then, you know, I did hear from all of the elders around me that he's a man of his time. He's not outside of the Swiss sort of framework on this. And I kind of, said, okay, but what do we do about it? And there didn't seem to be a lot of response at that time. I mean, later, lots of other things happened. Of course, the letter was written about Jung, and then Fanny's book came out and so on. I think they, um, as I was listening to you talk, Chris, I remembered, I mean, really, the reason I fell in love with Jung's work was because of Memories, Dreams, Reflections. I read that, and I thought that was Jung. I mean, I thought, Here's a person who's guided by his inner life and isn't really uh, isn't really a person who is concerned about uh, kind of wealth and status and so on. was this was my idea as as a rather you know young person reading that. And I wanted to be guided by my inner life. And so eventually, I started reading Jungian works. I mean, I read Boundaries of the Soul and then I, uh, sought out June Singer to be my analyst. Uh, and then I began to go sort of on my own journey, my own dreams and my own development, trying to figure out who I was from looking internally um, at what was coming up. I must say that wasn't the path ultimately that I followed in my life. I followed more the path of relationship, like my relationships to people and what comes up unconsciously in relationships as the Via Regia. I still follow my dreams, obviously. I think nobody uh, should risk not following their dreams uh, because it's information. But I I did feel through my study of Jung and then editing the Cambridge Companion of Jung and, um, and writing books using the theory, I, I like very much Jung's overall way of regarding the psyche and the way that it's, there are multiple self-states, there's not a strong organization around the ego. A lot gets projected. projected. Projection is like a primary defense. And also, I like the uh, work that he does with dreams and his clear recognition that um, the homo sapien is religious. There, there, you, it's, an, it's an archetype. It's an instinct. We have to use it or it will use us somehow. You know, we'll We'll worship kale, or we'll worship the non-gluten diet if we don't organize wow. ourselves in some way spiritually. Um, so there's a lot that I appreciate about Jung, but I also did not appreciate the elevation of him into being almost like a god figure, or uh, even a founder of a religion. I mean, to me, analytical psychology doesn't have enough stuff to be a religion. Religion has to have more stuff than it's got. And, and it's got, you know, I think the makings of a very good uh, theory for understanding individuation, for understanding the path that people can follow to get to know themselves better, understand their unconscious motivations and investigate their dreams. But it's got these failings that have to do with, um, I think, you know, making assumptions from a kind of elitist perspective that if you can recognize that, you can correct it. But if you can't recognize it, you might keep doing it, you know? Mm -hmm. And so that's what, I mean, I, I feel your book opens up the conversation. And I felt also John's chapter especially did open up the conversation about what should we do to, uh, you know, get out of the trap of repeating essentially a white 
complex or a white supremacist complex. I don't even like the term white supremacy, but I get what it means in terms of taking white people or white culture as being the top, you know, the top, top and everything else is down from there. Mm -hmm. But so how do we get out of that? How do we get past that? That's where I'd like to talk. I'd like to talk with you about, do you think the conversation that you've started, the conversation you're in, at the Jungian Psychoanalytic Association, do you think it's going to be a bigger conversation? Do you think it needs to be out there alongside of other conversations? Or do you think it can be? Uh, and I want to kind of move towards the issues that all of us are facing about how we stop othering, you know, how we can we stop othering? Do we always have to have others to carry our projections? Or can we wake up to the idea that we need to be interested in others and as a way of becoming more ourselves, you know? Uh, so I just want to hear from Chris and then maybe John about where does this conversation go? Is it a conversation you think is now going in a good direction? Does it influence the Jungian world? Um, or, you know, do you have something to say to uh, the larger world about Carl Jung? Uh, to the larger world about Carl Jung, it's not about Carl Jung. It's about a beautiful tool uh, that we have in analytic psychology. Tool is a weird word, but, you know, it's, it's not so much a philosophy. It's not a religion. Uh, it's worth looking at medically, reviewing it, approaching it as a medical uh, resource. And it, it's a, it's about human nature and that we have uh, we have the resources inside of us to compensate for a lot of pain, the psychological pain, uh, not everything. Um, but, uh, you asked really, really good questions, and I, I should have written them down. Uh, the conversation's happening. It's happening, and you, you probably know this, it's happening in a lot of different schools, a lot of different paradigms. Uh, it's not all about Jung, right? Um, but but amongst, amongst the, in the union world, we are, we are being listened to. And people are having conversations, and people have been pretty receptive to us. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I I find strength in reading people like Ibram X. Kendi, who has mm -hmm. this great, great documentary on Netflix, Stamped from the Beginning. Mm -hmm. uh, there are a lot of really powerful artists, philosophers, uh, the people of, of color writing on this stuff and have been for a long time. And they have really, really interesting and informative points of view. Uh, but I, I think that uh, people are making space for us to have the conversation. Is it going anywhere or is it a fad? I'm not a fad. Fanny's not a fad. Sam's not a fad. Mm -hmm. John is not a fad. Polly's not a fad. Uh, you know, we, we'll keep talking. So you, I mean, I think you're saying that Carl Jung is worth studying, worth reading. Analytical psychology is worth practicing. It's practice. It's really an applied practice. It's not a set of, set of ideas. And that the correctives that you're making are happening, and they're not that hard to correct, is what I'm getting. That people are interested, people are are in conversation and that you feel that uh, analytical psychology is moving on through this conversation about racism. I would say analytical psychology is learning how to engage in the conversation, learning how to actively engage in the conversation. Uh, moving on is not gonna happen anytime soon. I would say it is a very painful process. It's not pain free because we bring ourselves, we bring our internal horrors into the discussion. Does othering have to happen? I think othering has to happen. 
I don't think it has to be uh, so pejorative and it doesn't have to be looking at another person like a different species mm -hmm. or looking at their gender or their sexuality as less than mine. But I think othering has to happen because that's part of the psychologic process. We reflect. We, we need another's gaze to tell yeah. us where we yeah. stand. Yeah. We are. So, yeah. And, and that engagement often happens through a kind of a projective hook that makes the other an other. And if they're consistent enough in being their own subjects, we reflect back. Uh, Melanie Klein is really good on talking about the establishment of gratitude this way. They give us a reality check through their eyes. They give us a reality mm -hmm. check through their facial and ex the, the way we emote gives off reality checks. Then I can say, whoa, maybe that's me. Because mm -hmm. this person really isn't, they're not. So that happened with me and Jung. You see, mm -hmm. Jung was never the Christ to me. Mm -hmm. To me, Jung was... Uh, up there with Sigmund Freud, I do not erase Sigmund Freud's theory. Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of benefit to it. Um, and a very flawed human being. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So and I the first thing that comes to me when I think of Jung, he's very white. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. there was never for me an invitation to be one of his disciples. Never. Never wanted to. I just want to be able to see how he's seeing and maybe learn from that so I can take the cues from myself better. Don't need Jung though to do that, but but he gave us something that's invaluable. Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, I agree with you. I would say I want to hear from John on that, but I would also say that I think the conversation of othering bears continuing because I think you know, I know that the Buddha said that the way that human beings fall into what he calls the three poisons of greed, hatred, and ignorance is by making objects out of something that's not an object. And so that's, say, a very fundamental way of uh, othering. You know, things arise, we see them, we engage with them, they have meaning to us. If we try to nail them down, particularly nailing somebody down as really different from me, you know, or maybe not even human, maybe not a person like me. I think that nailing down is a problem. And I don't think it's the same thing as getting feedback or doing, you know, recognizing, asking the question, recognizing, ouch, you know, I said it wrong or geez, I was wrong there, or I thought something about you that wasn't going on with you. I think those kinds of engagements, you haven't objectified the other person. You're interested. You're curious. You're going on with it. It's when you objectify that you could kill them, that you could enslave them, that you could lynch them. That I don't think is necessary for humans. I think we have the capacity to live and to gauge with with this sense of being human without getting to the point where we dehumanize the other person, turn them into something that we mm -hmm. can use for ourselves. So that's that's where I would say that, you know, I do think we can back off of the kind of othering that allows us to kill and enslave and rape. You know, I mean, I'm thinking of what Rene Girard says, like, what is the solution? And the solution is to have Empathy for those who are victimized. And that breaks the spell of the scapegoating complex. And, and, and he uses, I, I'm sure he would say the same about Buddhism, um, but Christianity and Judaism, uh, you know, the scapegoat, God is with the scapegoat in Christianity, God is the scapegoat, and you have to mm -hmm. look at me who you scapegoated and wake up to what you're doing. You mm -hmm. know, but mm -hmm. I, I agree with you. I think, you know, um, uh, the way forward is for us to move out of I it relationships with other human beings to you know as Buber advises us to do is to see other people as a thou um that's that's like us and um and, and, and with whom we share a, a, a psychic uh a wholeness. Um the other thing that that Gerard says that I think is very poignant is 
that we're not going to go into the light in some sort of smooth way, but actually the more empathy breaks up the scapegoating complex, the more that, that doubles down and becomes problematic, which I think is where we are right now, at, at really a crisis point. You know, are we going to move into a, a place where the human community can live in this one planet as one people, or are we going to um, uh, destroy ourselves in the process? Because it really is getting to feel like it, it's really binary. One or the other is going to take take place. Um, yeah, things are it's, coming it, to a very crucial level, I think. Well, it seems that there, we're in a moment right now that does feel very critical. Um, I I tend to uh, get a lot and ally with uh, Bio Akamalafe, who is a Nigerian uh, psychologist, poet. He did study some Hillmanian, Jungian ideas as well. And um, something that I like about Bio is that he 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 feels like we we have to step back from the idea that we can control things. I mean, as humans, you know, we've got the human always in the center of everything. Yeah, we can understand this, we can control it. Even the idea that we're gonna save the planet, we're not saving the planet, we live on the planet. You know, we've got to deal with where we're living on the planet. Do we have to keep on as humans, destroying our environment, killing each other? We might not be here if that's the case. And you know, the zebras aren't gonna shed a tear for that. So bio basically saying that it's it's difficult to get off the sh the slave ship, like this the master slave dynamic, and he doesn't think we're off of it yet. He thinks we're no. still still on the journey, and that the only way to really get off of the slave ship is to stop believing that we know how to get off of the slave ship. <laughs> Instead, to you know engage, get to know each other recognize we don't know and and get closer in our, our let's say ability to depend on not knowing and then he says also you know bring in the ghosts bring back in all the animated features that we've left out for so long you know the the divinities the gods the small gods the big gods and so on um listen to voices that are human voices. So in a way, I think that part of what he's saying, he talks about making sanctuary for the monster, by which he doesn't mean the shadow. He doesn't really mean the shadow. He means make sanctuary for what you feel you cannot bear and you cannot stand and begin mm -hmm. to live into that and recognize and engage with it. So my my feeling is that, you know, in what you all are doing and what we're talking about here in regard to Jung psychology is that we're, we are essentially making sanctuary for the monster. We're making sanctuary for the bad part. <laughs> we're bringing it in. We're making a place. You know, we're talking about Jung's racism. We're making space to engage with that. We're making space to engage with mistakes that have been made and mistakes that have been made in training, but also really egregious mistakes that have been made in the whole way our society is organized. Now, can we change or really, you know, we can't erase those mistakes. Can we change the situation in which we would make those kinds of mistakes? I think maybe, I'm not sure, but I think maybe we could change the situation in which we dehumanize other people to the degree that we kill them, enslave them, rape them. I think we can change that. And I think I don't even want to be a psychologist if I can't assume that I could help with that. You know, I'd rather build a bridge or something because that's more practical than, than you know. So it's it seems to me that by the conversations you're having and the conversation we've had right now, that we are making sanctuary for the monster. We're bringing in the stuff that we really don't want to talk about and we don't really want to think about. And it's painful, but it's also actually something that is possible to talk about. You know, it's it's possible to get closer to it, to see what it is. And uh, um, so, you know, I'd like to hear any last words from Chris and then from John, and then uh, we'll close and uh, it's it's been great. <laughs>
Um, I, I yeah, I don't I don't know that I agree with Bayo with being on a slave ship. That metaphor doesn't work for me. I find it. Uh, uh, well, it's tragic. It's certainly intended to be tragic imagery, but I, I think it's a huge oversimplification in the wrong direction. Uh, and it would need more definition from Bio about the slave ship and the, the sanctuary idea, sanctuary for the ghost, sanctuary for the negative. Um, but have you have you heard him or read him or anything? Um, oh, uh, only what you shared. I, I yeah, you're, no, you're introducing I, I, me to him actually. So I would I love would, to meet with him and you in the future. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm hoping to have him on. But he's got a, he's got wonderful things online. But just his his short talk called "Making Sanctuary." Okay. Um, and uh, you can just Google him on uh, the idea that we're that we're stuck on the slave ship, that we're still on the journey. We haven't gotten to the other side uh, is is the, and I probably don't do justice, honestly, to his level of, he has a kind of poetic insight that's not immediately obvious. Um, and uh, and he's he also uh, has been helpful to me because I've I've become less certain that I know how to fix things, <laughs> you know, from hanging around with bio. <laughs> so I, I think you would enjoy hearing him talk about, particularly making sanctuary, that short talk, it's relatively short, uh, gives you some step in. But was there anything else that you wanted to add, Chris, before? Uh, well, I want to thank you for opening up your podcast to Jatin and I, and for broaching this very difficult conversation. I know that we kind of could have gone deep in a number of different ways, but this was a really good conversation. And uh, I, again, I'm grateful and I'm very happy that's with Polly Young. Well, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> my friend, my good friend now, and John. So what would I say? You know, I think despite Young's failings in this regard, which are certainly lamentable, uh, he does give us a, a hermeneutic tool that really gives us a way forward. And I think that's really what's most important. Uh, like you, I've never been a worshiper of Jung the man who regarded him as a saint or a guru. Uh, certainly a man of genius who had uh, some brilliant insights into the human psyche. And that can help us get more conscious, get more aware, more aware of the other and more aware of our, our life situation. And, and, and in some ways he points us a way forward uh, despite himself. And I think that's uh, th that's really where I come out. I don't think there's anything inherently racist about his ideas um, by any means. In fact, they can be actually useful in kind of breaking the yoke and the, the shackles of, of racism that, that you know keep us from each other and, and, and more than that, do terrible things. Yes, I, I, and I agree with you that Jung does give the solution even if he's inside of the problem. Sure. And in that way, it is always a way forward. And I'm, you know, I'm very grateful to be a Jungian and not to be Jung. Um, and he was grateful to be Jung and not a Jungian. But uh, <laughs> so it goes both ways. But uh, it's really been fun to be with the two of you. I look forward to being together again someday and maybe sometime in person. Can I say uh, one more thing, Polly? One more yes. thing real quick. I think the concept of race, while we're so used to using it, is itself racist. Yes. yes. And I think it keeps us in the loop. It bamboozles yeah. us. And yeah. it keeps us systematizing, keeping a fresh, keeping a new. When we talk about my race, uh, growing up around a number of races, it just gets us right into the whole paradigm. So well, I think that our language can shape our ideas this way. And if we make an effort not to use race, then we'll be thinking about the dynamic of how much we're actually alike. Absolutely. And I do think that that's part of what Bio is getting at when he says the getting off the slave ship, you know, that we're still stuck. And it, I think we're stuck because we do use this term race. I agree with you entirely on that, entirely. Oh. And, I look forward um, to watching Bio. Yeah, I think I think you enjoyed. So thank you so much, both of you. Oh, thank uh, you very much. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank it's you, John, too. <laughs>